we are going to get we are going to get started as you heard uh, Tim's recording the meeting um, we're going to record everything except for the uh, question and answer session because we want to make sure that everyone uh, feels comfortable and has an opportunity to speak freely um, so Everything up until then will be recorded and we'll send you a link to that along with a, a copy of the slides with all of our speaker notes afterwards. So um, please feel free to just listen and, and take it all in. Um, you don't, you're going to get all of the information um, and we really want you to just uh, be able to, to take it in and put all of your questions in chat. As we go, um, we're joined by one of our colleagues, uh, Susan Edwards, today, who's going to be helping us at the end with moderating a question and answer session. There will be plenty of time for question and answer. Um, so keep track of your questions, put them in chat as you go, or, or put them in chat at the end. She'll help us with that. Um, mute yourself if, if you haven't already. Um, and with that, I am going to uh, get started. So. Um, my name is Rachel Sandberg. I lead the library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. Um, we help scholars navigate publishing, intellectual property, and information policy like privacy and, and other issues in their research and teaching. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Tim Ballmer, our scholarly communication and copyright librarian. We hope, um, as I said, that, that you'll listen, take everything in, um, put your thinking caps on, ask us as many questions as you want. We'll have plenty of time for it. Um, and one last note before we really dive in, which is that while I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. Um, we're here to help you understand how the law works and what university policy is so that you can make informed decisions on your own about how to proceed with your professional activities, teaching and, and research. Um, we can't give you legal advice. We don't know all of the facts of your individual circumstances or projects, but what we're instead trying to do is paint a picture of, of how the law works and, and how university policy works where areas of risk lie and what some uh, best strategies are for navigating them. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, with that said, today we're going to help you understand how to make informed decision about materials that you're distributing in online or digital learning environments, whether that's in B courses or on the open web. After attending this webinar, we think you'll come away with three things. Um, first, a much better understanding of the law. Second, we think you'll feel equipped to make decisions with the implementable best practices that we're going to go over. And third, you're going to leave with information that you need about where to go if you need additional help. Next slide. To kick things off, we are basing our examples today around a course about protest movements, um, fictitious course about protest movements. For each of the materials that we see here on this slide that let's say we want to include as readings in our B course or as part of our PowerPoints or lecture materials, um, whether those materials be books or book chapters, journal articles, videos, and more, we have to think about the rights of the authors or entities who created or made that content not just in terms of copyright, but also any contracts, that is licenses that might apply. We're gonna to start to see today that the answers to what we're allowed to do in terms of posting or incorporating this third party content will differ based on whether that course is confined to B courses or posted on the open web. We're gonna talk about all of this in more detail. Next slide. As just a preview for why we need to think about these questions, well, here we can see that copyright in the particular journal article being assigned is held by the Midwest Political Science Association. As we'll talk more about today, if you want to upload a copy of the article, as opposed to just link to it on the web or link to it in the library's databases, you're going to need to think about whether your use fits into a copyright exception. Next slide. Likewise, copyright in the book that's being assigned in this case is held by the publisher, not the author. So just asking the author's permission to post a few chapters to your B course site isn't going to do you any good here because it's the publisher who holds all the rights. So if you want to upload chapters from this book to B courses, you either need permission from the publisher or you need to make a determination that your intended uploading fits into an exception to copyright like fair use. Next slide. And in the case of this video, copyright is held by the New York Times. 
But as we'll learn today, if all you're doing is linking to this video online or embedding the YouTube code on your web page, you're not actually performing any of the rights protected by copyright, like reproduction. So you don't even need to make a copyright decision here unless you want to actually upload the MP4 file of the video itself. Next slide. So don't worry about any of this. Today, you're going to learn how to understand everything that we're talking about here. We're going to help you make good choices under the law and understand varying levels of risk involved in creating and sharing content for your courses. Next slide. Thanks, Rachel. So we want to start that journey today by grounding everyone in the understanding that simply attributing the author doesn't actually mean that we have the right to upload or distribute the content to others. Um, but attribution is something that we do as a matter of scholarly and professional practice, of course. But whether we can actually distribute or include content to begin with is instead based on whether we hold the copyright. And if not, whether we have some form of permission, either because the law says we do or because the person who does hold the copyright has granted that gift to us. So let's understand more about why we need permission if we don't own the copyright. What actually is copyright? At its core, copyright is incredibly simple. Congress created a law to effectuate a provision of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. That provision authorized Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And they mean science broadly here to include all sorts of scientific, scholarly, and creative endeavors. And basically, the drafters of the Constitution wanted to develop an incentive for artists to create things. So we as a society all benefit if people can build on the discoveries that came before them while having an incentive to create new things. So Congress is authorized to give artists some protections in their creations. And the way they did this was to grant exclusive rights to control the fruits of their creativity. These exclusive rights operate as an incentive to create things in the first place. But Congress shouldn't give artists those rights indefinitely because protection that lasts forever would actually cut against reuse and building on the works that came before. This would actually hamper the progress of science and the arts. So it's important to be aware of the origins of copyright because sometimes we tend to think of it as a blocker um, for creative expression and for scholarship when actually it's designed to do the opposite. So let's look at what the exclusive rights are that Congress came up with when they created the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act defines five exclusive rights. So what does that mean? Well, let's say I'm the author of this book. Before I would transfer my copyright to a publisher, that copyright is actually a bundle of five exclusive rights. First is reproduction, it means I can make copies of the text of the book. I can prepare derivative works. That means I can adapt the book into another format, like turning it into a motion picture or writing a second edition. Um, I have the right of distribution, means I can pass out copies of the book or portions of the book. I can publicly perform the work, meaning I can read the book aloud in public, including charging for money. And I can publicly display the book, meaning I can blow up the pages and put them on display in a public space. And the copyright holder holds these rights exclusively, meaning no one else can do any of those five things. Notice what isn't a protected exclusive right, directing someone to a lawfully distributed or displayed copy. Uh, if you do this, you're not invoking any of the exclusive rights simply by providing links to lawfully uploaded content. That's why you never even have to worry about whether you're infringing copyright if what you're doing is linking to a lawfully posted or distributed version of a work. Okay, so we said that the carrot and stick balance with copyright is that the exclusive rights are granted only for a limited period of time in order to incentivize the creation of more works. And the duration of copyright can vary, but in the United States, it's typically at least 70 years after when the author dies. So that means the life of the author plus an additional 70 years after. So what does this mean? So within this protected period of time, 
uh, you need the copyright owner permission to exercise any of those five exclusive rights that we just talked about. So you might be thinking right now that, you know, that so-called limited period of time is really, really long. And, you know, how is anyone supposed to be able to use anything if these exclusive rights last so long? Well, first of all, there are some crucial limitations on what copyright protects in the first place. And this is important because not everything that an author creates is subject to copyright protection under the Copyright Act. First, copyright only protects expression, not ideas and not facts. So you can't copyright a fact, a statistic, or a method. Obviously, you should still be citing your sources if you're doing something like using a statistic because you need to conform to best practice for scholarship. But the point is that you don't need to ask permission to be able to use it. For example, uh, here's a World Bank and OECD data on gross domestic product growth. There is absolutely nothing about this graph or the underlying data that is protectable by copyright. Uh, the fact that the World Bank tries to apply a license to it, and you can see there's a Creative Commons license indicated in the upper left hand of the image. This is really inappropriate in this instance because there's nothing that is expressive about this. Thus, there's no copyright. Thus, there's nothing to license in the first place. So data are facts and a line graph has no original expression. You know, there's only so many ways that you can show GDP growth as a function of time. Likely the reason the World Bank put a license on this is because they don't fully understand copyright or they just wanna make sure that you cite the World Bank. But we're smart as researchers and we know that attribution has nothing to do with whether one needs permission to actually use a work. So let's look at something that might seem a little bit more difficult to parse. Um, here's a map of where groundwater exists within a pyramid in Egypt. This seems more expressive than just facts or data, but it's really not. The author might think this is protectable by copyright, but they've done nothing here but draw lines and map locations with very basic numerals, you know, symbols and nomenclature. And you really shouldn't need anyone's permission to make use of this map figure, you know, in your PowerPoints, instructional materials and the like. And you certainly don't uh, for the underlying factual information that's powering this map. Uh, there's another category of work that isn't protected by copyright, and that is work that's in the public domain. And if something's in the public domain, it's also available for use with no permission required. But we need to be careful, you know, just because something is online doesn't necessarily mean that it's in the public domain. Uh, when we talk about the public domain, there are two types of works. So first, U.S. government works are in the public domain because those works aren't eligible for copyright protection. This means that you can use something like a federal government publication without having to obtain permission to use it. Now, again, you should still cite your sources. Um, so public domain for U.S. government works only applies to the federal government. So state governments and foreign government works might be different. They might have copyright attached to them. The second category of works that are in the public domain is for works that originally were protected by copyright, but to which the copyright has expired. So take the example of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare's plays were written so long ago that copyright has expired. This means that say, if I wanted to rewrite Romeo and Juliet with a completely different ending, I could do this and I wouldn't have to get permission from anyone to be able to do so. I would be perfectly entitled to do this because the underlying work is in the public domain and I can make any derivative work that I want. But say someone else took Romeo and Juliet and annotated it. Now I wouldn't be able to use their new edition without permission because their annotations receive copyright. It's just the original text that's what's in the public domain. So right now for works published in the US, everything published prior to 1925 is in the public domain. And as we've already talked about for more recent works, copyright will expire 70 years after the death of the author. Okay, so 
Tim has helped us understand what is protected by copyright, that's original expression, um, and what isn't, and, and that's facts and ideas, and federal government works. And we've said that if something is protected by copyright, then the copyright owner has those five exclusive rights Tim went over for a long time. It's at least 70 years after the author dies. Um, and in, in other cases, it's even longer, depending on if it was a corporate author. That means that if we want to do one of those five exclusive light, rights, like reproduce something, distribute it, perform it, during the period of time when there is protection, for example, we want to include the materials in our class B course site, um, or we want to use the materials in a PowerPoint, then we need the copyright owner's permission. Except, next slide, except we don't need the copyright owner's permission if our intended use of the copyright protected work falls into a critical exception like fair use. So that's what we're gonna focus on next. Next slide. Let's actually understand what fair use is. It's an exception built into the Copyright Act in section 107 of the Copyright Act that Congress included specifically to help encourage or protect criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research. Well, Congress wanted to encourage this type of idea exchange, so they built in this provision, providing that the fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. That sounds great. The fair use of a copyrighted work for these purposes is not an infringement. So our next question is, of course, what is a fair use? Next slide. In order to determine whether our use is a fair use, Congress set forth four factors that a court can balance in determining whether a use is fair. We're gonna explore these four factors in the context of our hypothetical course in which we are uploading a chapter from protest, this protest as pedagogy book to our B course site. Factor one of the balancing test looks at the purpose and character of our intended use. Nonprofit educational uses are more likely to be considered fair than commercial uses, which is great for us. But actually really what a court is starting to look at is not whether the use is, or, or not just whether the use is nonprofit and educational rather than commercial, but increasingly they're looking to whether the use is transformative. Are you planning on using the work in a different way or for a different purpose than the original creator intended the work? Or alternatively, are you using it in a way that adds new insights and understandings? Well, in this case, the book was written to guide instruction. But if you have the students closely read and discuss the chapter, you can be adding new insights and understandings. In other words, you can be transforming this work the more you have the students discuss it or the more you discuss it in a lecture, as opposed to just assigning it for reading. Combined with the fact that you're also making a nonprofit educational use, factor one leans heavily in, in our favor here. So let's move on to factor two, which addresses the nature of the, the copyrighted work. Under this factor, a use is more likely to be fair if you're using a factual or scholarly work rather than a more creative work. But don't worry too much about this factor because courts hate dealing with it. They have no idea of what is creative or artistic versus scholarly, and they don't want to be in the business of determining it, nor do we really want them to be in that business. So factor two is not usually very consequential in fair use analysis, especially in academic settings. But in any case, factor two leans in our favor here because this is a chapter from a scholarly book. Moving on to factor three, this factor explores how much of the original work are you using and how important is the portion you're using to that overall work. Despite what you may have heard anecdotally, there is no set percentage that's okay to use. I'll say that again. 
there is no set amount or percentage that's okay to use or that is too much to use. You could use only a small portion of a work, but if it's the most crucial portion, that could weigh against fair use. In other cases, it may be perfectly fine to need to use the entire thing and have it not weigh against fair use. What's important for this factor instead is using the amount of the work that is tailored to your purpose. In our case here, using one chapter to make certain points may very well be narrowly tailored to our purpose, thus making factor three neutral at worst and favorable to us in more likely. Finally, factor four. Factor four looks at whether your use would supplant the market for the original. In other words, would somebody in your shoes otherwise have purchased or licensed the work in order to read or, or see the entire thing? If we're just using a chapter, that isn't going to supplant sales for the book because someone would still need to purchase the, the whole book if they wanted to read the book. So factor four weighs in our favor. But you can start to see that the more of protest and pedagogy that you want to post to B courses, the more it could cut into and supplant the, the market for the original. So to recap here, we're strong on factors one, two, and, fo and four, and we're fairly strong on factor three. So our use of this chapter for purpose of real discussion in our B course will likely be a fair use, and we can go ahead and post it. Now, of course, we never really know if we made the right determination until a court is asked to decide. In an academic context, courts typically look to the first and fourth factors, the purpose and character of the use for which they ask, is it nonprofit and educational and is it transformative? And what, and factor four, what is the effect upon the original market? And we are very strong on one and four with posting this chapter. It is always going to be a balancing test. There's no bright line, there's no formula you can apply, but keep in mind that when you balance these factors, the fair use exception is purposefully broad and flexible to promote academic freedom, expression, education, and debate. Okay, next slide, please. There are also arguments to be made, although they haven't been tested yet in court, that during this global health crisis, more educational uses are likely to be fair. Tim and I were part of this statement put out by copyright scholars and librarians in our roles, in which we argue that the first and fourth factors are particularly strong for fair use right now. For factor one, the wide variety of public benefits deriving from education leads us to believe that this purpose would weigh extremely heavily in favor of fair use. For example, in the case Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust, the court made it clear that providing access to persons with disabilities was a strong public interest that weighed heavily in the fair use assessment. Similarly, other courts have found that allowing reproduction of a film documenting Kennedy's assassination was in the public interest, and allowing redistribution of leaked internal memos about problems with electronic voting machines also favored fair use. In this case, under factor one, the benefit to the public in providing remote coursework is obvious when it enables teaching to continue in the face of social distance, distancing measures or quarantine, or when access to physical library materials is impossible. So in our view, the public benefit of these measures is without a doubt of at least equal importance in these cases. For factor four, which looks at the effect of the use on the potential market or value for the copyrighted work. This factor requires a balancing of the public benefit um, or, or ba requires balancing the public benefit versus the personal gain that the copyright owner would have received um, if the use is denied. While in normal circumstances, there may be licensing markets for some books or, or journal articles or other items, the spontaneity of a move to remote teaching under emergency circumstances reduces the importance of this factor. Checking for and relying on licensed alternatives bolsters the case for fair use under the fourth factor, but the lack of time to check for licenses should not be a barrier to meeting the needs of our communities. Of course, while fair use is absolutely appropriate to support the heightened demands presented by this emergency, the longer the emergency lasts, the more we begin to re revert to the regular realm of fair use that I just covered in the previous slide.
But as we saw in the previous slide, we still have very strong fair use arguments regardless. Next slide. So there are some other copyright exceptions, that is other exceptions to those five exclusive rights that you may have heard about, exceptions like the TEACH Act. And these exceptions, you could rely on them to use or upload content without getting permission, except that in almost every single instance, the fair use exception, section 107, provides you with a stronger basis for using the material than relying on any of these other exceptions. For instance, the TEACH Act of 2002 expanded certain statutory exemptions of copyright law to accommodate distance education. Much like the fair use exception, which is section 107, the TEACH Act, which is section 110.2, provides another means under which the copyrighted work itself, rather than a link, can be uploaded to B courses without first seeking the copyright holder's permission. But the TEACH Act only covers performing or displaying certain types of works. And further, based on the type of work, you're allowed to display or perform only certain amounts of that work and only for a limited period of time. You can perform an entire non-dramatic literary or musical work, such as a recorded reading of a novel or a poem. You can perform a limited and reasonable portion of any other work, such as acting out a scene from a film. But you can display any work in an, in an amount only comparable to that which would be used during a physical class setting. Meaning you could only show the portion of the protest film shown here produced by KQED that you would have otherwise shown live in class or the portion of a book chapter students would have been asked to read in class. Now there are in fact many more limitations with the, with the TEACH Act, but a key one I'm trying to highlight here that limits its utility as a copyright exception for online learning is the fact that if you want to display materials like this video or like book chapters, they can be made accessible and retained by students only for the length of a class session. Thus, unlike fair use, the TEACH Act does not provide leeway to post something to B courses for the length even of the semester. If you wanna show, show a film, then to rely on the TEACH Act, you'd only be able to show the film for the period of time that you'd be showing it in person. You can't just upload a film and leave it uploaded for the semester relying on the TEACH Act. You might be able to under fair use, but not under the TEACH Act. Next slide. Okay, so we've looked at how strong fair use is. What if your intended use does not fall under one of the exceptions to copyright like fair use? How can you still use the copyrighted work in your instruction? Well, one way to do this is to get a license, essentially seeking permission to use the copyrighted material. This is very common. For instance, authors getting permission to use someone's copyrighted photograph in, the book, in a book they're publishing, but you can also seek out openly licensed materials which already grant particular permissions in advance. For example, you can see that in this YouTube video, Gothamist is sharing the video under a Creative Commons attribution license, which permits reuse under the license terms from the get-go without having to ask permission from the copyright holder. Now you can, of course, as we said before, always link to the video without ever having to make a copyright decision. But in this case, if you actually wanted to upload, that is reproduce a copy of the video itself, well then you already have a pre-applied license allowing you to do that. Next slide. You may have seen some Creative Commons license works already online, such as on Wikipedia or open access journal articles and images and graphics from repositories like Flickr or the Noun Project. Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization that promotes the sharing and reuse of creative, educational, and scientific works by supplying standardized public licenses that anyone can use. Instead of an all rights reserved approach, that is the default with copyright, those five exclusive rights, Creative Commons licenses allow creators to keep their copyright, but grant permissions for others to use their works in a particular way. At the heart of Creative Commons are the six licenses shown here on the left. They allow creators to apply their choice of Creative Commons license to their particular creations. 
And when authors do this, they ensure that they receive credit for their works because all Creative Commons licenses require attribution, but they grant certain permissions allowing people, anyone to use the works without having to ask the author every time first. Now, in addition to these six Creative Commons licenses, you can see on the right that there are a few other tools from Creative Commons that help expand and mark material that's in the public domain. You can find more information on Creative Commons licensing and open licenses on our website, but the key takeaway here is that there is a growing collection of openly licensed educational, scientific, and creative works that you can use in your course instruction and permission is already granted in advance. And you too can create and share your work uh, under Creative Commons licenses that makes it easy, easier for others to use it. Next slide. So even while we've been talking about copyright and copyright is one of the primary legal considerations for your course content development, there are a few other considerations that you need to keep in mind as you build your resources for online instruction. And one of these is contracts. So let's explore a little bit more about what this is. So broadly speaking, when we say contracts, we mean the types of agreements that institutions and users enter into in order to be able to use various types of content. Uh, these agreements apply in addition to the rules of copyright. And as we'll see, sometimes these contracts funnel users into agreeing to provisions that are even more restrictive than what copyright permits. So one example of what we're talking about is website terms of use. Many websites have terms of use that are considered what are called browse wrap agreements, meaning that users consent to these terms simply by browsing the website. So here is the terms of use from the website of the Harry Ransom Center. Uh, that's an archive and museum in Austin, Texas. Now it says that if users want to quote large amounts of text, images, or other content from the site, they have to contact the center to ask permission first. And users must do this even if normally downloading and using an image would be considered a fair use. So browser app agreements are not always enforceable by a court. Courts in different jurisdictions may require that users have either what's called actual or constructive notice of the terms of use. This means essentially, you know, would a reasonable person have been aware of the terms based on how the website content was presented. Another type of contract is a database agreement, <clears throat> uh, which are, these are entered into by libraries or universities, which controls your ability to use certain types of content. Now, sometimes database agreements focus on the access side of things by say limiting a right to make downloads or sometimes on the republishing side by restricting circulation of the content. And it's important to understand that if you are accessing materials from library databases, the database agreement applies to you, even if you personally didn't sign or agree to anything yourself. Now, to complicate things even a bit more, only a few institutions do a great job of providing visibility into the terms of all their agreements. But at the same time, some forward-looking agreements can permit broad access and use of the database content. And some even include specific mentions that the contract doesn't override important exceptions to copyright, such as fair use. Finally, if you want to include content from a library's special collections, there might be another layer of contracts baked into a donor agreement. Sometimes the donors of a library or arch archives collection comes with specific terms or other strings attached. So even if your use of an image from say Bancroft library might be considered a fair use, sometimes you're required to get permission to use the material or you might be limited at what you can do with that material. But the good news is that the agreements with memory institutions and libraries are often more open and negotiable than we see those with commercial vendors. So as we've seen, contracts are another important aspect for you to be aware of as you go ahead and piece together content for your online courses. And 
while some of these agreements can be quite complex, it's important for you to understand that they exist and for you to make, be able to make risk calculations accordingly. And of course, the libraries here help you with that. Okay. So let's take stock of where we are for a minute. Tim and I have gone over what is protected by copyright and how to think about the exceptions you can rely on to use copyright protected materials in your courses. We've also just talked about how various licenses, whether through website terms of use or library databases, might play into things. You now know how the law works, I promise. Um, enough anyway to make informed decisions about how to proceed. But now I wanna build up your confidence even more by explaining some other aspects of law and policy that empower you to think critically about risk or the lack thereof under certain educational parameters. Next slide. The first thing we wanna make you aware of is the UC system-wide policy when it comes to fair use. Now this is not the law, we've already looked at the law. This is instead a policy from the University of California that explains their position on the law and how that impacts you. Under a policy they issued in 2015, the UC stated that it wants to support fair use in teaching and research. And under this 2015 policy, if you are acting in the scope of your employment and you can show that you've adopted an informed, reasonable and good faith approach to using copyright protected content, the university will cover your defense in a lawsuit. So good news, if you follow the guidelines we've talked about here and the best practices we're about to go over, which involve making informed and reasonable decisions, the university will defend you in work-related lawsuits. You might still be sued and, and lose, but the university will take care of your defense. And receiving the university's legal defense is a good thing because in copyright suits for damages, if a court imposes statutory damages, copyright owners stand to receive a hefty sum per work infringed, as opposed to actual the actual damages they may have suffered. Statutory damages can in some cases be significantly more than the actual damages suffered because the range of statutory damages per work you infringe is anywhere between $750 per work and $30,000 per work. But it can go up to $150,000 per work if the court finds your infringement was willful. Next slide. Second, you should know about a legal doctrine called sovereign immunity. If a copyright owner wants to bring a claim against our university, they could pursue an injunction asking the University of California to discontinue their practices, that is, take something down, but they could not seek monetary damages, that is, no statutory damages, against the University of California in a copyright lawsuit. This is because state universities, as, instru as instruments of state government, and including university officers acting in their official capacity, are protected under the 11th Amendment Doctrine of Sovereign Immunity unless the university has consented to suit or waives immunity, which they're probably not going to do. State government entities and officers acting in their official capacity are not immune, however, from injunctive relief, meaning they can, as I mentioned, they can still be told to stop what they're doing, take the material down. They just can't be sued for monetary damages. In 1990, Congress tried to pass something called, well, Congress did pass something called the Copyright Remedy Clarification Act, or CRCA, which attempted to abrogate state sovereign immunity for monetary damages. Unfortunately for Congress, every single federal court that has ever considered a case under the CRCA since its enactment has found it to be unconstitutional. So although the CRCA is temporarily still on the books, no court has ever enforced it regarding attempt, the attempted abrogation of sovereign, sovereign immunity. And in fact, recently the Supreme Court took up a case addressing CRCA's constitutionality once and for all and confirmed that yes, its efforts to abrogate state sovereign immunity are unconstitutional. So if Congress wants to make a law trying to do away with state sovereign immunity for copyright cases, they have to go back to the drawing board. Now there are a couple of things to note here about the application of sovereign immunity. It applies to state institutions and officers acting in their official capacity. So here's one instance in which uh, we have a, a leg up on Stanford. 
they're a private institution, um, they don't get sovereign immunity. But it applies, as I mentioned, to state institutions and officers acting in their official capacity. When you are posting materials to a course website, arguably that's not at the direction of the university and arguably that's you acting in your individual capacity, meaning you still could be individually sued in your own name for monetary damages. And as we just learned in the previous slide, being on the hook for monetary damages as an individual is no fun. They can go up to $150,000 per work that's infringed if there is a showing of willfulness, which is why it's so important to follow the best practices that we're recommending. Also, it's important to note that sovereign immunity abrogates monetary suits only in intellectual property cases, not other cases that could be brought against you or that you could be sued for, such as breach of contract or one of those license agreements. So you can still be sued, even if you're acting in your official capacity, you could still be sued for breach of contract. State sovereign immunity only affects um, monetary damages for copyright cases. So taking stock again, we now know what the law is, and now we also know how to evaluate risk based on university policy and the doctrine of sovereign immunity. So let's integrate our knowledge of the law and university policy by distilling some of that information into some best practices for sharing content in B courses. And we hope that these best practices will provide good rules of thumb in leveraging technologies like B courses in your course design and delivery. So there are questions that come up regularly from instructors and faculty such as, you know, is it fair use to upload PDFs of scholarly articles to B courses or how much of a textbook can I post to B courses or how many pages or how many chapters can I share and make it still be a fair use. As we've talked about, there's no real clear answer to any of these questions, and it's really dependent on the context of each situation. But I wanna reiterate a few guidelines that we mentioned earlier. Um, first, you don't even have to make a fair use decision if you're linking to material that's lawfully uploaded to the web, and you don't have to make a fair use determination to include works that the library already licenses. So, if you're able to simply provide links to these resources, then go for it. Also, you don't need to make any fair use decision or ask permission to post things for materials that are in the public domain. You know, as we already learned, works in the public domain are free of copyright restrictions and you're able to use them without having to ask permission from the copyright holder. In addition, there are openly licensed works such as Creative Commons, and you're free to upload a copy to big courses, you know, as long as you're following the conditions of those open licenses. But if none of these things apply and you need to make a determination about whether posting content to big courses would be a fair use, and you can engage the material in such a way that will push the balance of the four factors we talked about in the direction of making your use a fair use. One was that one was that you can do this by transforming the materials and also sh demonstrating how the interaction with the content is necessary to your pedagogical purpose. This hits on that first factor of the fair use analysis that we talked about. Another aspect is only using as much as you need in order to achieve the student learning goals. So, you know, do you need to upload an entire PDF of a textbook when you're only really focusing on the content from a few chapters? So say you want to upload content from a textbook like Endless Forms, Most Beautiful, an excerpt of which is shown here. The point is, the more of that book that you want to upload to B courses, the more you should work with the material and transform the material for it to lean in the direction of it being considered a fair use. Finally, if you can't link to lawfully uploaded content from the web or include content from exi existing library licensed resources, and you're not using public domain and you're not using Creative Commons materials and you feel that your, your use is not a fair use, you know, you always have the option to seek permission from the rights holder to use and share that content. Okay, Tim went over best practices for putting content in B courses, but what about if you want to make your course site available to the world or you're teaching a for-profit course? 
all of a sudden the critical safeguards of just using what you need for a particular purpose and acting in a nonprofit educational context seem to evaporate. Next slide. All is not lost. You just need to put a little more thought into what you're doing if you want to make content available openly on the web as opposed to in B courses. When it comes to assigning readings, if you're putting stuff on the open web or teaching a for-profit course, then you need to think about even more linking to the to materials that are posted online already, not uploading them, but linking to existing materials, using public domain content or Creative Commons licensed material. You would want to rely on fair use less and only if it, it the scope of what you would be able to do and, and what's considered fair should be more narrowly construed if you're making the content available beyond the context of, of a B course. You're probably in a position where you more likely are going to need to get permission or a license to upload, to upload a con um, the content from the rights holder. And it's important to note here that library licenses typically do not cover open online courses or non-Berkeley students, meaning that if you want to actually post content on the web that comes from our databases, that often will violate our license agreements because you're making it available to non-Berkeley students. And you could be sued in addition to the campus access to that material being cut off. So it's, it's an important distinction to keep in mind when you're offering the material or when you're assigning readings um, for the world as opposed to just for Berkeley students. Okay, next slide. Again, I'm focusing on the beyond B courses realm. So in the beyond B courses realm, if you wanna share your slides or notes, um, again, same, same kind of rules apply. Your fair use is going to have to be construed um, more narrowly. You're gonna have to rely more on short quotes as opposed to putting the entire chapter in your slides or notes. Um, you really want to incorporate it more into the pedagogical statement you're trying to make. For example, this is an excerpt from Endless Forms Most Beautiful. I like to use it to show the, how powerful scientific storytelling can be. That's really a, a transformative way of using this um, material. It's no longer just about the content um, that's being offered, but about what this, con we're adding new insights or understanding to it and what it says about scientific storytelling. Um, otherwise, get a permission or a license. Next slide. Finally, if you're putting material on, on the open web or teaching a for-profit course, then when it comes to using video or music, if possible, just link to the existing copy that's available online. For example, you could direct students to pause your recording and then follow the link to the video and watch it and then return to your recording or lecture rather than having the video play during your uh, recording or lecture. If it is important to display the video during the, video, the recording or lecture, use only what's needed and pause the video and intersperse it with lecture material. Next slide. So now we can turn to the last uh, takeaway for today. So that's where to go for more help. Uh, we want to highlight four key resources you should know about um, if you need some more assistance. Uh, these are, you know, the first one is guidance from the University of California Office of the President that applies to all of the University of California campuses. Uh, the second are resources from um, our office, the Office of Scholarly Communication Services. The third is the UC Berkeley Libraries eReserves program. And the final one um, is related to content specific information from Berkeley Library's uh, Media Resource Center. So let's talk briefly about these and also see where you can go to get more information. So first we have the guidance from the University of California and as I mentioned this applies to all the UC schools. This system-wide guidance covers copyright in relation to online courses and instruction and good news you know you basically already know what it says it largely just repeats the same guidance we've given you today uh, when we discuss best practices. So first, link when you can, link to news articles, videos on the open web, and use library licensed resources. Second, if you don't want uh, or can't link, then decide whether your use is a fair use. 
we know it's more likely to be fair when you're only using what you need, when you're really working with and transforming the material, um, when the digital copies are only provided for the duration of the course in which they're needed, and of course, when access is limited to students only enrolled in the course. Uh, third, you know, if your use exceeds fair use, you could ask for, for permission from the rights holder. And then finally, if you need more help, you know, you can ask your friendly librarian. So next up, you know, Rachel and I are part of our Office of Scholarly Communication Services, and we can help with a lot of questions you might have that come up with regard to copyright and course development and online classes, uh, B courses, fair use, publishing, understanding licensing, and other issue areas. Uh, you can check out our website for more information. You can also send us an email at the address here, and we're really happy to answer any questions over email or even set up a consultation with you on Zoom or on the phone. And while today we talk mostly about, you know, your rights and responsibilities under copyright, um, I'm sure many of you are also creating your own scholarship and educational materials, and we can talk with you more about this, uh, creating open educational resources. We even have tools such as the Pressbooks uh, publishing platform for open textbook authoring, and also even small grants if you're interested in creating your own OERs. Another service that uh, the Berkeley Library is providing under these uncertain COVID-19 conditions is an e-reserves program. Uh, we know that the library um, doesn't have print reserves available right now and won't have these available during the fall semester either. So instructors for the summer and fall, fall courses are invited to send their syllabi to the library through the email address posted here. Um, and the syllabi will be reviewed by the library's new uh, course e-reserves project team. And they'll track all the requests and help search for electronic versions of articles, books, and other assigned materials, um, especially in the resources that we already license and own through the library. And they can also help look for other open access options for you. So the e-reserves team is also coordinating with selector librarians to acquire digital content needed for courses that we don't already have. Um, and once the library, um, once, you know, once we're back, at least in some form, the library hopes to be able to scan uh, print-only material, digitize it, and help make it available uh, via the Hottie Trust Emergency Temporary Access Service. And finally, for those of you who have questions or concerns related specifically to including multimedia material like audio and video into your courses, um, the library has the Media Resources Center that can help with this. So, um, the Media Resources Center has provided some guidelines specific to online instruction, especially for delivery of courses over Zoom. So, for example, from a copyright or contract perspective, you know, one of the best practices when including media in Zoom would be the link from library hosted uh, sources. Um, we know that many instructors also link to video they find on YouTube or other online sources that are not library hosted. And even though we know that from a copyright perspective, linking is generally fine, sometimes the original uploader didn't have the right to do so in the first place and a video gets taken down to, due to a copyright complaint. So the, the library staff can help try to obtain license access to some of these clips if you run into those problems. Um, another challenge that the Media Resources Center has seen is simply relying on using an instructor's paid personal streaming account, such as, you know, those we subscribe to via Netflix, Hulu, Prime Video. So um, most of these are, are only licensed for personal use and not for instruction. And also sometimes the DRM on these videos will block them from being shown within Zoom itself. So finally, if you're thinking about generating your own video clips, um, say from a DVD or other physical media, the recommendation is to use the shortest portion of what you need and the Media Resources Center can help assist you in making brief clips or determining which platforms um, and help advise on practices to kind of uh, practices to limit the availability of the file to the shortest time that will be required for your educational purpose. So the takeaway here is that, you know, sometimes it's hard to deliver 
contemporary video content within course instruction, but the library and the Media Resources Center are here to help you work through some of these challenges to be able to serve students and your course development needs. So at this point, we're gonna stop the recording now and I'm gonna stop screen sharing and we can move to the questions uh, that you had uh, in the chat. And any other questions you wanna to ask too. 